On the far right, my friend Daniel Eck. Daniel is a tech genius, CEO, entrepreneur, so-so guitar player, and great father. He's been at it since age 14, and now at 31 has become the friendly disruptor of recorded music. With 40 million users and 10 million subscribers, the music business roots for Spotify to continue its friendly disruption. A college dropout who was turned down for a job at Google, he founded Spotify at age 23. Uh, next to him, my friend Tom Freston. When the not yet named MTV was looking for executives with no TV experience, Tom Freston knew he was right for the job. After eight years roaming the globe, they assumed he was a drug dealer. Little did they know he was a cultural spy. Tom spent 26 years pushing the likes of Beavis and Butthead, Yo MTV Raps, and South Park. Beloved by artists and employees alike, post MTV, he took charge of Bono's nonprofit and mentored the Op Oprah Winfrey Network and most recently Vice. The obvious first uh, question that, um, that I have, guys, is both, both of these guys have been, have stood out as um, fans and great fans of music and, and they both really respect the creative process. Um, they respect uh, content, they respect artists. Um, how do you think the fact that both of you guys love music and, and love artists and, and really respect the process had to do with the success that you both had in, in launching these two great companies? Well, you know, in the, in the case of MTV, which is so long ago, <clears throat> but still relevant. I mean, we, we basically started a, a network with nothing. We didn't have any programming. We didn't have any money to really do anything. And we didn't have anybody with any experience in making a television network. But what we had was a small group of people who were incredibly passionate about music and, you know, in the Silicon Valley parlance, that were looking, thought they could actually change the world. We had a vision that this would work. We didn't know quite what it would be. Everyone we dealt with told us it was a bad idea. But at the end of the day, it was that passion and perseverance that, and connection to music and the relationships we built with the acts who built it together that paid off. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd concur with that. I think the, uh, for, for us, it was the fact that, you know, following MTV, following growing up, uh, I actually learned how to speak English through MTV, which is kind of another kind of irony. But, uh, you know, um, it, it, it's interesting because you know, I grew up with music and, uh, and then Napster came along, which really changed my way of looking at the internet. I thought it was the most amazing invention ever because here all of a sudden was all this music that I couldn't afford um, to get and, and I just had it all. I just kind of went down Led Zeppelin, Beatles, like all of these the great ones, uh, and discovered so much music, but it fundamentally didn't work for the artists, which was the important part. So when we started Spotify, we wanted to change that. We knew that the whole kind of thing that Napster set off was positive for consumers because people started listening to more music now than ever before. But what didn't work was the business model so artists could be compensated. So we said, what, what if we can make something that's actually more convenient than piracy? Um, and the idea is, if you do, people will want to pay for music again. And that turned out to be true. That's great. Um, those of us that and have run record companies um, and own record companies are, are notoriously slow um, and scared of change. Um, I think both these companies have had um, tough journeys, and I'm sure there's some, uh, they could share some great wisdom as to how it was uh, dealing with the labels and the rest of the industry to acquire rights. Well, record companies, are, are, most companies are resistant to change, but the record industry was sort of notoriously difficult. I mean, they even, uh, they were against MTV, they were against Spotify, they were against the, v, the audio cassette. When stereo first came out, they didn't like that either because they thought it was some kind of scam to, tell, to sell two speakers instead of one. So, but in almost every case, the, this new technology or new delivery system, whatever, ends up being sort of a windfall or a great next step for the music industry. In the beginning, nobody wanted to give us uh, music videos. <clears throat> we claimed, hey, we're lucky we're not charging you. It's the three minute free ad on television and uh, you should be happy for that. And, you know, in fact, your old boss told us, he said, 
No one gets anything fucking free from MCA. <laughs> Sid Scheinberg. <laughs> But at the end of the day, once we got a lot of these young artists on there and it was thought and discovered that they could sell records and we got artists to do it, everybody wanted to be on. So one after another, the record companies made agreements with us to, to provide us videos and in the end we, we began to pay them for those, but on a fixed fee basis. Very different from the situation he faces because we had eight major record company groups in the old days and a lot of independents. He's dealing with basically two and a half record companies who, you know, they're kind of clubby and it's an issue. Yeah, well, I mean, um, the only thing I usually tell people about it is it took us three and a half years to even get the first licenses done. And I started having hair and obviously now I don't have any. So <laughs> that speaks to the process. Um, it uh, took a lot of time. Um, any, any time anybody starts talking about the music business, um, there's always you know, stories of wild behavior. Um, I think the executives catch some of this from hanging around the talent. Um, maybe you guys could share with us if there's a favorite story <laughs> or you know, moment. You know, could be one of us crazy executives, could be a crazy artist. I know Tom. Uh, I remember backstage at UCLA Poly Pavilion at an MTV Awards when uh, Howard Stern decided to flash his ass and become fart man right, right in front of his eyes. So, you know, that, from there it was all downhill. But you got, a, you got a, a good one there, Tom? Well, there's a bunch of them. I remember, you know, in the, in the early days we used to have these contests because there was no digital, there was no, like, social media. So we really needed to get word of mouth. So we'd do these contests where you could win things, you, you know, instead of a contest sort ticket, you know, you win like a house, a party house, or we, you know, we win a one night stand with Van Halen, go on stage with Van Halen, one of your artists. Yes, sir. I remember this. So the contest winner, we were kind of naive, the contest winner uh, spent a lot of time with the band and they got him, uh, I would say, drunk and addled with drugs <laughs> and uh, brought him on stage and put a pie in his face. And then the guy standing next to me said, he's looking at his friend. He, this, I'm standing next to his friend, he says, he's doing all right for a guy with a steel plate in his head, isn't he? <laughs> Realize we had to be a little more careful going forward with the kind of yeah. contest we would do. Da Daniel was a little more sheltered because he was in, he was in Sweden uh, and he deals mostly with executives, I think, rather than artists. But right. And you got I, one? I, I think I missed the fun times, too. I mean, I, I wish I was there when Tom was there, to be honest. Um, because and, and everyone keeps referring back to the fun times, but the one one story uh, I will say is um, I was supposed to have some meetings in London, and there was this private equity company called Terra Firma that eventually ended up buying EMI, and uh, they had this huge um, um, sort of I, I was supposed to have this meeting, and they uh, canceled the meeting, and for two days I was sort of waiting. Uh, to get the meeting confirmed. And only later did I discover that they found this account called Flowers and Candles. There were several million pounds uh, that the auditors were trying to figure out what it was. And obviously that was uh, sort of uh, um, cocaine and, and uh, prostitutes and other things that they then <laughs> discovered on the books. Uh, so they had, had to do some uh, quick uh, uh, running around trying to fix the situation on that one. Stemming back, you know, 20 years or so. But that, that's, that shows how the old music industry used to be. Great. Um, people, uh, <laughs> people often talk about how the music industry, more than any other media business, blew it during the digital revolution. Um, what lessons can we take from that? Well, you know, they, a lot of industries have been upended they did a bunch of things. I mean, for once, they, they eliminated the single at some point. They said, we're not going to sell singles anymore. And then they you know, kept trying to force people to buy uh, albums for $13, $15 with 10 tracks on it. You couldn't buy a single. And, uh, but they also wouldn't let file sharing happen. So there was no way to legally purchase music online. So people didn't really have a choice. But they also sort of introduced in the early 80s the instrument of their demise, which was the CD, which was sort of the gateway drug to file sharing, a perfect digital copy that at the end of the day, you know, kind of, while it created this great boom, I mean, the biggest boom the record industry's ever seen and led to, I think, a lot of arrogance and laziness, it, it made them wide open for 
the disruption that has occurred and from which they're still trying to claw their way back with things like Spotify, you know, helping them on that road. Um, Daniel, uh, in, in, a lot of people are, um, are comparing um, Spotify in a lot of ways to Netflix, both in terms of both companies expanding internationally and globally, um, and, and the fact, you know, I, I, th I personally think the fact that Netflix just passed through 50 million subscribers, you're already at 10. Um, how are you going to get to 50? Um, and how is global um, really impacting your business? Yeah, so I, I think it's right that you can make a lot of comparison. And the companies are similar in a lot of regards. But fundamentally, we're operating in two very different uh, businesses as well. So there are similarities, and there's things that's not so similar, like, for instance, uh, the prevalence of free. Uh, when you look in, at music, music has always in some shape or form been free. We've always had radio being promotion, uh, being free for consumers. We've had television for a while be free, but especially the last uh, decade or so, it's moved more and more to paid, more people going cable, more people going subscription for HBO or Netflix or uh, even Hulu, um, etc. Um, so, you know, there, there are similarities and, and then there are things that's d definitely not so similar. I think for us, like the, the biggest thing right now is we're seeing so much interesting stuff going on in the 58 countries we have around the world. You know, for instance, when we turned on uh, Turkey, we started licensing a lot of Turkish music and all of a sudden in Germany, usage started spiking. And I couldn't figure it out in the beginning on, until someone told me that there's like four or five million people in Germany who are actually of Turkish descent. So when you start figuring out, Spotify all of a sudden became a place where they could listen to Turkish music, uh, which wasn't really readily available uh, in Germany any other way. Um, and, and personally, I think those are things that's super interesting um, and that we're just starting to scratch the surface uh, of when you start getting that kind of cultural inbound thing going on. Um, and then going forward, I think for us, how do we get to 50? It's education, just getting out there in front of people, talking about it. It's pretty phenomenal that you can have all the world's music in your pocket for 10 bucks a month. You know, um, every change in music has basically started with youth and youth branding. Um, Tom, you went from MTV, then ran all of Viacom, um, historically passed on uh, investing in MySpace, which went from uh, it being a, a colossal failure um, for Fox, and then found your way um, to Vice, which if, if I recall, you invested in at Viacom around the same time that um, the MySpace Right. Yeah, investment we invested was available. In. Can you, you know, and can you can you draw some parallels of, you know, because really you're dealing with youth culture at Vice the same way Daniel is at Spotify and you were at MTV. Can you can you draw some comparisons and what can we learn from the launch of Vice and the ongoing success of Vice and how it uh, disrupted everything? Well, Vice came. They came across my radar screen like 2006, and uh, you know they they have been in business since 1994, actually. And I, I was fascinated. I liked these guys. I liked the things they were interested in. And you know, it seemed to me that any kind of enduring youth business, you know, is basically always created by outsiders. Nobody in the system. Nothing good ever comes out of a boardroom. You look back and I think of Rolling Stone. I think of like Saturday Night Live business, which you know, while it was nested within NBC, was very much its own independent entity. And, and MTV itself was, you know, we, were, we had like two latchkey parents, one are communications and American Express, so we were left on our own. But the Vice folks had developed their own voice. They had a vision that said that, you know, everyone, YouTube and these people were putting out platforms, but no one was talking about making online video, quality online video with a story, punch you in the stomach. And uh, they had a unique style. And I was taken to them and, and bought half the company that they, they were the company that they were going to you know, use for their video platform. So they have since uh, gone on and achieved their original vision. I've now reconnected with them. So. You know, today, um, artists can record at home. They can essentially nearly distribute their music um, on their own. Um, Daniel, do the recent um, 
Jay-Z, Samsung deals and Apple U2 deals change any of your strategy about dealing direct, um, say, with established artists at Spotify? Um, not really. I mean, our view is um, there's, there's been artists in the past that have gotten back their masters and then choose to go direct to services. Um, that's happened to us as well. Um, we keep working with every actor in the industry. I think for us, we view ourselves as a platform, um, and as that platform, uh, you know, whether we're dealing with a record company or dealing with an individual artist, we, we think about all the service we can provide to our users and making it uh, the best thing we can for that user at the same time as we compensate the rights holder. So, I mean, for us, I would say we're not in the business of trying to go direct to artists. Uh, we think we've got a long um, and successful partnership with labels and artists alike, and that will continue whether it's in the form of a label or the artist coming direct. Um, Tom, do you feel that um, there's more or less respect for music um, these days, in general? Well, you know, oddly, there's more music around than ever. I don't, th and there's a lot of great music, but I don't think it drives the culture the way it did in the 60s, 70s, you know, through the 80s. For front technology seems to have sort of taken that seat in the culture. Uh, that's not to say it's not powerful, but, you know, and I think has a, you know, still has a strong emotional appeal to a lot of people. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say it's, you know, technology is pretty hard to beat these days. We used to wait for the Sgt. Pepper record or whatever to come out, and now you wait for, you know, I, for Apple to have their annual conference and hear what new products are, what the new phone is. Right. So it has replaced it. Do you think uh, that's because of the format of music itself, though? The, the what of music? The so we were talking before about, you know, singles becoming albums, et cetera, but music has never really changed uh, I mean, my view is that music has always been constrained by the format it's been on. It's uh, the only thing that's happened is we put more songs in an album uh, based on it. We had 72 minute CDs, then 80 minutes, and you just went from 10 to 12 to 14 songs. That's the only difference. But now we have a medium to Vice's point, which is uh, audio, it's visual, and it's interactive. What's so amazing, for instance, with Vice that I feel is like it's not just text. It's actual videos as well. It's an actual Photography experience. and you know, Photography, told, exactly. told the multimedia. Yeah. yeah, so could it be that music doesn't play the role it used to be because it doesn't play with the medium uh, of the I internet? think that that's partially true. And I, I, the other thing is, you know, music historically has had moments of, uh, you know, where there's like a musical movement that captures everyone, uh, everyone's attention. A lot of stuff these days is in really narrow niches, but someone who can connect to a wide variety of audiences and, and be out there. There's a few artists that do that today, but it doesn't, it's like we're dying for a new movement. But I, I don't know if a new movement comes along, it's gonna save the music business because they gotta really change their thing about how they sell that movement. The, um, the live music business has never been stronger. Okay, my, my personal feeling is that's because music is everywhere. You can, all, you can almost go all the way back to Napster. The fact that the, the demonetization of recorded music might have been bad for labels. It hasn't necessarily been bad um, for artists because the live phenomenon, both in festivals um, and just generally live touring, has has really uh, never been better. Has um, especially for you, Daniel. How does the live impact your charts and what gets played? And are the are the two really interconnected? Yeah, definitely. I mean. It's funny because um, whenever we look at a city and make a top 100 track, and when we see an artist touring it at the city, the artist always makes it to the top 100 of that city uh, by the virtue of just touring. Um, and, and I mean, if you think about it, it's really an interplay. Like people, they listen to the album before going to the show to kind of um, get in the right mood, and then afterwards to go back, oh, that song, I didn't really know that, that's amazing, and then starts listening to it, and it kind of goes on for weeks and weeks after that. It's an experience. That's the point uh, about the format, too. What was so amazing with MTV was that 
uh, we did something new based on the medium, which was television. We created music videos, which was another artistic expression. Uh, and it took the form in the beginning, it was really simple. It was just the band performing, but you know, people realized what they could do with the medium and kind of take it to the next level, which I thought, you know, um, just as a consumer watching it was pretty extraordinary. It was a totally different way of discovering music. The whole new visual vocabulary, they kind of come back now too. I mean, they're, they really are able to make them at low cost. I mean, showing once again, you don't need money to be really creative. It's almost, it helps not to have a lot of money available. Guys, thanks very much. I think uh, at this point, we'd like to get you guys involved and maybe take some questions. Um, we have one major disruptor out there. The first question goes to uh, the old pirate himself, Mr. Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> I know, a, I know a few of these guys. I don't know Daniel, but uh, my question is for him. Um, uh, as somebody who's been in the music business a little while, it's interesting when you just said, uh, when you deal with uh, how the artist is, uh, is taken care of, uh, it basically, to me, in my experiences, has been we're at the end of the pipeline because when money goes to a, a label, uh, in a stream, I think it trickles to the, to the artist because that's the way the system is basically set up. Do you see anything in your future where we might get a raise directly from you? <laughs> As opposed to going through the bullshit you have to go through to deal with a, a label these days. Uh, and uh, because that is what happens. It, and it's kind of interesting when you have conversations like this, the words industry and labels come up but how the stream of, of revenue gets to the, the artists themselves, particularly young and struggling artists, uh, it's really hard for that to actually happen in real life if you're a young artist. So uh, I would hope that, that, that all of the, uh, the music service groups would kind of look at that and see that it doesn't really, it's one thing is when it goes to the, to the record label, uh, most of it doesn't get to the artist, but right. it would sure be nice if a little more did. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I agree, obviously. Um, I, I think that there's a couple of issues um, that you're highlighting as well. So the first is transparency, which is super important. And we definitely have a big role uh, to play there. I can just talk about what ended up happening in my home country, Sweden, which was sort of the first on streaming. So it, it's not it wasn't in a dissimilar position to what we have here in the, in, uh, the US right now. Uh, there were a lot of artists that didn't understand streaming, was it good, was it bad for them? Um, and Spotify quite quickly started becoming the biggest uh, music service. Um, and right now we're about 70% of all revenues in Sweden, including physical as well. So this is a massive part and the music industry has actually gone up in revenues. But the biggest thing uh, that happened during that process is transparency. So we started uh, showing actually how many streams the artists had. Um, and as a consequence, they started asking the labels, you know, okay, what does that mean? How much will actually go out? And already today, we have an artist website where we say roughly how much um, a thousand streams or a million streams actually mean in terms of dollars back to artists. Um, but because of how we published that, that started creating the dialogue between the artist and the industry. Um, and as a side consequence, because streaming became such a massive part of the revenues, uh, labels even changed how they started paying out the artists. So they started out paying, instead of once a year, uh, started paying out much more frequent. So I think the transparency is the first piece. Then the second piece is, you know, we've been very uh, transparent about how our, our model works, which is we pay out 70% to, um, uh, of, of every dollar we get in, 70% goes out the door to pay uh, the rights holders, whether it's the publishers, whether it's the label, or even in some cases when we have artists directly, it's really the same deal. So, you know, if you're an artist and you upload your work to Spotify, um, if, if you make um, $10,000, 70% of that goes directly back to Daniel, the Daniel, how, how much did you pay for, what's your yearly, how much we pay for rights this year? Um, we're, 
going to pay out a little bit more than a billion dollars um, to the music industry this year. But it's actually still lower, right, Irving, than what we used to get. Of course. Yes. <laughs> but you know what? That's why I was looking for a raise. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sell one of the planes. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Buffett. Um, I see Mr. Davis there. Yeah, but that gentleman was first. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, tight in contemplating Jimmy's question, I'm just curious how you know, young artists and trying to make it in the music world might be able to use, utilize services like Spotify to better know their audiences. Um, this story of, the Tur of what you're saying in Turkey is really fascinating. I have a good friend I came with who's from Turkey, and it's really interesting to think about um, that there might be audiences we don't even know about and how we might be able to connect with them. Yeah, I mean, I think we're only in the beginning to trying to figure that out. But if you're on Spotify, what we do is we uh, give you a bunch of analytics tools that lets you basically see where your music gets played, in which countries, in which cities, um, age groups, um, um, genders, um, all of that really to kind of get a better sense of who your audience is. The other thing you get with Spotify is that you, you can follow an artist if you like them. And the benefit of that, if you're an artist, is that you've now got a direct communication to your fan. So you can post about concert tickets, you can post about merchandising, you can post about new records that you have, and that can all happen through the Spotify platform. But um, I, you know, this, this is a big educational process. Uh, streaming is the biggest change to the music industry since really the inception of recorded music. Um, and that's a huge thing that we all got to do tr to try to educate uh, musicians and fans alike of just how street works. I believe Mr. Freston's got a question. Just a question, because I have heard this. Uh, you pay a, um, over a billion dollars to the industry, but that, I, I heard that this money actually goes to the labels at the corporate at the corporate level and that the people who actually run the labels have no idea how much money you're paying them or how it flows. So they're not really incented in your success in a way. Is that true? Um, I, I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I think it depends on labels. Um, but you know, it is right that we typically, just like iTunes, by the way, and, and pretty much every, every other streaming service, we have one deal with the parent company, say, of Universal Music um, globally. Uh, and then we pay into that. Um, and, and that is then supposed to trickle Fair down um, to uh, the no, different I, labels and artists alike. I, you know, I will say that um, 10 years ago, I would guess that in a normal, normal artist, 35, 40% of your money came from recorded music. Um, as an industry now, that's probably less than 5%. You know, and that's what forces um, mm. my friends like Jimmy Buffett to continue touring because they can't make it on their recordings. Um, Mr. Davis. So the, the person on the stage with the best war stories <clears throat> with artists is definitely you, Irving. The question I would like to ask is to hear one of your stories, but I won't put you on the spot. The question <laughs> that I will ask is to Tom. So Tom, when, if you're 18 years old and if you think back in the 1980s when somebody did watch a music video on MTV, the complimentary experience they have now is going to YouTube and watching a music video. Do you think that the experience from a artist perspective and a user perspective is the same as good, different? Can you, can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, well, the one big difference is when you watched MTV, you were watching basically something that was pre-programmed to you by the professional, or whatever that meant. But you know, you were seeing stuff you didn't know what it was going to be in advance. So it was an issue of surprise. When you're on YouTube, you're getting stuff on demand, and you know that that that. that sort of led to one of the reasons MTV kind of moved off music videos, because people could get to see exactly what video they want whenever they want to see it. So you're already sort of preconditioned. One of the problems is when you do that, you know, you, you're kind of limiting your, uh, you know, your, your exposure to new stuff. But I would say, you know, basically, yeah, you're going to sit there, you're going to nod your head, you're going to feel really good, you know, maybe I'll see that again or wait and see the next video. But you know, the idea of consuming a video is probably something. And the idea the same. of watching on a computer or a smartphone is not. Is you it know, kids today are they're watching uh, they're watching sitcoms on smartphones for God's sake. I mean, we used to think they'd never do that, right. but uh, 
you, it makes you wonder if people are going to move in the houses and not get real televisions. Right. All right, guys, we've got, I'm, I'm sorry we don't have much more time for questions, but we, we got roughly a minute, minute and a half. Each, one, each of you want to give a quick wrap up, 30 seconds or so? I keep thinking when I listen to Daniel, I keep thinking about George Carlin in, uh, in the 70s. He used to do this takeoff of the KTEL ads that says, you can get every record ever recorded, every record ever recorded. We will back a truck up to your house <laughs> and give you every record ever recorded for one low price, which is sort of the Spotify promise. Yeah. So that's it. Daniel? That's the future. Uh, I, I'd, I'd just say, look, I mean, my, my view um, to musicians as well is that we're only in the beginning of this and there's a billion people right now out there consuming music. Uh, subscription music is just in the early days. I happen to believe that uh, if we fast forward this out a few years, the music industry um, will be, the recorded music industry will be bigger than it's ever been. And that's going to be good for artists, it's going to be good for fans, um, and more than anything else, it's going to open so much more opportunity for artists to be creative again and rethink the formats, because that's the biggest thing that I'm excited about, it's just how do we take the next step, what's music for the internet, and not just uh, television or um, a CD, but what's music for the internet, that, and that's a huge thing back to the artist to try to invent on that. Guys, thanks very much. I think that was great. Thank you.